So welcome everybody to this panel on the arts, envisioning meanings and transferring hope. We've got four wonderful guests with us today. So there's Alexandra Blaney, Chief Financial Officer of Shine Global. Do you want to give us a wave? Thank you. We've got Susanna Brogel, artist based in New York. Give us a wave. Yep. And David, well. <laughs> David Fried, an interdisciplinary artist based in Germany. Have a wave from you, David, please. <laughs> and then Megan Falk, owner and curator of House of Savoy, also based in the uh, US. <laughs> So the, what brings us all together with this panel is thinking about how art might how art might express, how it might mean, how it might engage audiences in meaning, how it might help us to see things in a more hopeful light. So thinking of the thinking of art as something that tries to appeal to the senses, the artist offers a space for imagination. So it presents us with perhaps other worlds other ways of seeing. Visual artworks ask us to see things differently, to step outside of our everyday automatic processes that shape our engagement with our environments and other people around us. By encouraging such experience in the audience, art can help us to live better. But can it, can it actually help us live better? Can it actually help us live more hopeful lives? To what extent can art help us to look forwards, to look to different futures? So, I realised I also forgot to introduce myself. Hi, well, I'm Karen Simacek. I'm an associate professor at the University of Warwick, and it's my job really here today as to be the moderator, to be the chair. So what I'm now going to do is go around each of you on this panel and hear from you about your own personal story about when, how, why and the arts changed your own life. So shall we start with you, Alexandra? Yeah, hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm Alexandra Blaney. I'm the CFO and Director of Production at Shine Global, which is a nonprofit media production company. We produce films about children and families and share their stories of resilience in order to inspire action and change. Um, so our films tackle all sorts of issues facing children around the world. Um, but our goal is that even in the grim circumstances, the films are vehicles for action and that they tell these stories of hope to inspire people for change. Um, so our films include the, the Oscar winning Innocente, which was about a homeless and undocumented girl in San Diego who was an artist, um, or the the Oscar nominated War Dance, which was about child soldiers in the war zone in Uganda. Um, and recent films include uh, Homefront, which was about children of veterans, wounded veterans in the US. Um, and our upcoming film, Home is Somewhere Else, which is an animated documentary about different stories of immigration. So lots of different issues all around the world. Um, and we also just recently launched a new initiative, the Children's Resilience in Film Award. Um, and this award is going to honor the filmmakers who are telling stories about children's resilience. Um, our goal is to bring this hope and inspiration to the world in such a grim time and uh, uplift the voices of children because we really need to listen to them. Um, so for me personally, so I, for me, I always I, love movies. Always. Sorry, some feedback. <laughs> uh, I'll try again. So for me personally, I always loved movies and I always wanted to work in social activism or politics to try and make the world a better place. But I never really put them together until this class in college where we watched a film called La Hora de los Hornos, The Hour of the Furnaces, which is an Argentine film from the 60s by Fernando Solanas. And it was part of this philosophy and third cinema movement that film is and is not a passive experience, that it's really about activism. Um, so that film in particular was banned in the 60s. It was against the dictatorship. So the very act of going to see this movie was an act of rebellion against the dictatorship. Um, and then they structured that film to have you know, pauses for the audience to engage and talk about the issues. And so that after watching that movie, that's what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to work in nonprofit documentary film. I didn't even know if that existed. So I moved to New York and found on my first day looking for jobs on Craigslist, nonprofit documentary film. And I've been there for 13 years. So um, 
Yeah, that's for me is film is really inspirational. You're hitting us as the audience on so many levels, uh, emotionally, intellectually, visually, and that's how you engage people to think about the world in a different way and start imagining how they can be a part of the change. That's fant a fantastic start for us there. Thank you so much. So can we come next to you, David? Oh, okay. Um, well, I'm a multidisciplinary but concept-driven visual artist, which, which means in, in principle, I, I have to go from my philosophies, my concepts, my observations in the world and find or even learn or even create different mediums. Like one recent one I've done is uh, uh, interactive granite doesn't exist, but it's the only way I could explore and explain certain concepts. And so as a multidisciplinary, um, uh, there are billions of influences that come into my mind. And so as a young person, and I'm not going to describe my art here, but as a, as a young person, two of the most biggest influences I had as, as a kid were conditional, uh, perhaps as, as, as you've spoken to, is we look at the world, right? And then it was also uh, a, a work of art, you could say. So those two things were, um, I grew up with uh, poor but loving parents in, in Manhattan, in New York City. Um, you, you could be poor back then and live in New York City. Um, and a tiny apartment, no windows. Uh, they were both chain smokers. The, 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 when I say no windows, they were curtained because of the opposite building, et cetera. And, uh, and my mother was quite epileptic, uh, severely, and it was a life or death thing every day in, in my childhood. And growing up, I think I would reach for a paper bag and start drawing on it. Um, and we didn't have money for real art supplies and stuff, but I started drawing and eventually painting to make my own windows on the world. So that was something that influenced me very heavily. It was my environment, my immediate environment uh, uh, in the beginning. But then um, I was six years old and we're all watching the, the Apollo mission going off. And I, I was already in love with Salvador Dali and Tangay and, and all the surrealists. A child can, can look at surrealism and get a lot more than the abstract expressionists at, at, at that age, I think. And what happened to me was um, we saw this earth rise uh, that was shot on Apollo 8 before they landed on them. It was a, a, a rounding of a, a orbit around the, the lunar surface and we saw the earth rising over uh, the moon. And now this iconic image really made an impact on me really then. And in child's mind, uh, I looked at it and I think I said, wow, uh, and anybody who was alive back then could see, it, it seemed quite intuitive and, and, and apparent that this is a magical blue marble hanging there in, in, in the vast, hostile, cold space. And we could see that it was an inf a finite resource, yeah? that, that it had infinite possibilities for life, but it was quite a finite thing we could see for the first time. And... Um, you could say something like, in my, in my mind, what happened was we were all in the same boat. What goes around comes around. And I remember thinking back then of an old common sense thing, and I deal with this in my art a lot, is flipping common sense things on, on their head is, well, I remember my parents telling me, you shouldn't shit where you eat, right? It's a hygienic thing. It also means don't talk bad about people behind their backs. But we could all see kind of intuitively there is no elsewhere. And so the young mind came up with this kind of intuitive thing, which is, oh, well, then, therefore, we must learn to shit where we eat. And this is what conservation, this is what uh, ecology, uh, deep ecology, this is what sustainability is really all about. And although that was not born from an artist, it had a huge impact because it's an image. And that image had such a huge impact on me in, in, in my formative years uh, going ahead. And I never stopped uh, painting 
uh, and when I was 11, I was accepted to the Art Students League as the first child in their adult classes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, today my art is dealing with these aspects uh, of, of interdependent dynamic relationships in general and about issues that affect the entire globe from the bottom up. Um, that's what I can say about my first. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And so next to you, Suzanne. Hi, uh, I'm Suzanne Drogel. I'm a visual artist. Um, I work using many mediums, um, sculpture, installation, photography, performative work, but across uh, mediums, my subject matter remains um, race, systemic racism, and the construct of whiteness within the United States. So in thinking about this topic today, um, I was thinking about since childhood, I've been pretty shy and introverted. And um, art gave me a way to go beyond ordinary language. It opened things up for me. I found ways of communicating beyond words. I've been trying to think back to the first time I saw art made from materials and objects that were not considered art materials, because that's how I came to work with art. I, I can't even, who knows what the first thing was I saw, but um, in my work, I take everyday objects that are in my life, health and beauty products, debris from the St. Patrick's Day parade, looking at my ambivalence of my Irish American her heritage. And I, I make art out of these things. And then the viewer can enter the space and have a range of reactions and they are bringing to it their experience. So I guess art, you know, drew me in because there's not like one correct answer, one correct response. It's a dialogue. Another way that art has changed me is by building friendships, dialogue and community. And that was another way of drawing me out of my, in, my introversion. Not that it's completely gone, but it's a way of working through it. I wanted to take a minute to actually uplift the name of my artist friend, um, Jason Keeling. Um, he influenced me a lot. He just passed away eight days ago. Oh. And in thinking, um, in thinking about this, you know, I was thinking about community we uh, we became very close and traveled this like art journey together. It was art that brought us together. And I think a lot of our conversations had like this subject of art and hope as a subtext. You know, that, that's why we kept going at it. So I just I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, so over to you, Megan. Okay. Um, I'm Megan Falk and I'm a trained artist actually. Um, I went to the University of Texas at Austin for studio art and um, I started working in galleries and decided to, um, well first I did art in high school that had to do with body image, kind of a, um, a mid 2000s before that was kind of acceptable like nowadays um and i would work with fabric patterns um and i once stayed with for it um because i struggled with it as um, a teenager so i thought i would it, art was a way for me to express that and then while working in galleries, I saw that a lot of mid-career artists weren't getting noticed in Miami that had such great ideas. So I would create events um, to get them noticed, and which led me to work with a private family office in the UK, Quartet. And I work 
we're them and we um, we manage uh, uh, private assets, so our automobiles, um, jewelry, um, and much real estate, but I specialize in art. And um, I like it. It's amazing. It's um, We have a great connection with Banksy, and um, he is a real person. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I love his art. I think it's pretty provocative and it allows, um, it's controversial, allows everyone to question society and the world we live in. And yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. So from what everybody was saying there, we've got themes, some really lovely themes around the power of art, the power of art to connect the power of art to create communities, communities within, between artists as well as communities with audiences as well. But it's also really interesting, that idea, going back to something Alexandra was saying about spaces, art providing spaces to think, spaces to reflect. And that's another kind of connection, I guess, that art can provide in a weird way, in the absence it allows an audience to put them put their thinking in that space and in that sense connect. So one of the mechanisms by which art seems to do this is by both from the point of view of the artist and also the audience is it does this through the imagination. So getting us to either as an artist having to reimagine, having to reimagine maybe certain things that people have told you that you want to sort of play with those ideas, play with those concepts. The imagination comes in there, but also for an audience to engage, whether it's in those those um, moments of absence, those spaces, or if it's triggered in response to something that you find particularly stimulating, the imagination seems to be there. So why, what is the imagination as, as important as I'm sort of making out here? How do you see the role of imagination in art? So who would like to go first? Well, I'll start because I think for for me and filmmaking, I'm really, there is imagination in creating the films, definitely. But I think I'll let the other panelists speak about that more it's because I'm doing mostly documentary. So I'm not imagining the story, even though there is imagination going into the creative process. But for the audience side, we are, you know, our audiences are either people that have never even heard of this subject, it's so far away from them, or they are seeing themselves on screen. And for both of those audiences, the imagination is is critical to what we're trying to achieve. Um, the audiences that have no idea about this issue, um, we're using the film to get them to imagine, what if this was their life? What if this was their kid? What if this circumstance was happening in their community? Um, and getting them to have that empathy for that story and um, and getting them to, you know, put themselves in those shoes, bringing them to these new places they never would have thought of, and then imagining how they would address those issues, how they might try and change it. Uh, and then for the, the audience members that see themselves reflected on screen, see those stories, um, this is where the element of hope is actually the most important part of our film is because even in all of the, you know, really horrible, terrible circumstances we're showing kids in with child labor or child soldiering or discrimination, all of them, we're also showing the resilience of these protagonists, the ways that they are not only just surviving, but even thriving in these circumstances. So audience members who might be experiencing homelessness or discrimination or just even feel that something about that story resonates with them personally. They're seeing on screen how these protagonists are, are addressing it and overcoming it. And so they can imagine themselves, they're seeing it happening. And so then they can imagine it happening for themselves as well. I, I mean, we've got, I've gotten some really moving emails from teenagers around the world who have seen films that like really change their perspective on their own lives, that they were really in a depressed place, didn't think that 
because they were homeless or because they were black that they couldn't do something. But then they saw this kid on screen do it. And now they're imagining how they can make a difference in the world themselves. So to what extent, I wonder from the other panel members, to what extent do you also feel yeah, that art can make that real world difference? That art can um, help change perspectives? Is that the right way to put it? Is, or, or do you see the role of the imagination in arts differently? So David, you look like you're, you're ready to... Okay. Um, <laughs> when we talk about art, I guess we have to consider that art is even language. It, as as uh, I wouldn't say that all, all, all words are metaphors, or, don't call me that. But um, there, are the, there is narrative and there's, there's more uh, abstract and uh, I'll talk about later because uh, I, I wouldn't be able to do this tonight with all the crazy things going on here uh, without some notes so I'm just going to hold off on a, a similar point for later but um, historically I think observation is first and then you have imagination so just like what, what you're doing um, with your films Alexandra is you, you have to see something first you have to be involved in, in, in a world around you that you can make a difference in. And then, of course, imagination is it, that world could also be mythology, that we're, world historically from, from Lascaux cave paintings uh, to Sesame Street. We're, 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 we have a, an art form that is showing us the world and things we can uh, and things understand, we can about, um, which is quite different than perhaps the work I do and so many other does. Banksy, for instance, is uh, obviously a little bit more on that illustrative side um, and his engagement in street art, you know, th th there's something else there. But when we look at uh, some of the uh, installation artists and, and other people in this world, this contemporary art uh, world can seem quite divorced from any direct purpose. Of course, the artists can still go and do whatever they want in the world with their purposes and their charities or whatever else. But the art seems to be rather removed from this narrative. And um, I guess what art can convey is a lot more intuitive than science can. And of course, film is great at this. Books are great at this. Um, um, but contemporary art kind of liberated itself from these constraints for some time now. And it's not only about art being about itself, but it's about the internalization of the viewer and how much stronger that can be than any one message an artist may have infused into their work or been inspired by that concept, then it, it, it morphs and it can multiply into so much more for so many people. So that kind of openness is, is something that is the delight, perhaps we could say of abstract, well, not abstract, but non-figurative, non-representational, non-representational art. And it, it, art's really here in that sense, art. It's really here to make you dot your own connections. It, and it's made to make you feel like it's all about how you yourself perceive things. And, and that's an important thing because uh, you find yourself in, in, in a work. And um, I think it drives on some level of ambiguity. Um, and in that, it, it, it might not be able to show hope without the viewer. It might not be able to show uh, a, 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 a great narrative or imaginative thing without just that that confrontation with something a person cannot quite grasp immediately and they're forced like can a I um, things out. yeah yeah go ahead Susan. can I jump off of that? yeah can I jump off of that because I was thinking um if imagination you know art didn't have such an influence it couldn't change things why what is like the first thing that that oppressors try to censor right and you know like the topic i deal with white white privilege and whiteness you know there's states in the united states right now passing laws to disallow 
certain books, especially on these topics from being discussed, you know, Matt, imagination, I, I even. imagination is, is powerful. I mean, you're banning Toni Morrison, you know, Toni Morrison uses imagination to discuss systemic racism and among, you know, among other topics. And, you know, uh, the, the power and beauty of, of blackness and it's a, it's a threat. So I, I, came to this question of, well, yeah, you know, what do they try to censor? So I think imagination is very powerful. It's, it, art is one of the first things that oppressors will try to cut from the school, from education, you know? So it's, it's powerful when you- go in budgets just period when there are crisis, because for some reason and, in, but, in, on this planet, art, is, although it's everything we have from religion to to words, to everything that we wear and, and, and do and do in life, uh, somehow art isn't important. So uh, it's not it's not going to feed you necessarily, yeah. uh, at least physically. And, so it's the first to go. Yeah. And using imagination and like uh, maybe abstraction, like David was talking about, you know, I've, I found that as a tactic when people want to shut down on certain topics and even self-censor. That's why I sometimes use strategies like visual language, you know, a little bit abstraction, but there's a narrative behind it because if you just say it bluntly, some people don't want to engage the topic, you know? So it's sort of getting, getting beyond closed doors. So I wonder if we can bring in Megan at this point, because I think this is a nice connection to something you said in your introduction where you were talking about wanting to raise the profile of artists that you knew that weren't being recognised. There's a sense there in which, you know, the openness that you've been talking about so far and that idea of self-revelation from art. Perhaps, Megan, you might speak about that need to bring in diverse voices. Yeah. Uh, well, I also work with architects as well, and um, I think an, art, um, an architect and designer I work with is Mario Romano, and he works. he's a sustainable architect that works with the material Corian, and it's very, um, it's pretty much kind of indestructible material, <laughs> um, and his career is starting to take off, um, but he's worked very hard to get there. And the st sustainability of it is very neat, um, the aspect of it. And he uses, he's from California, and so the ocean um, and nature play a role in his work, and which I think is neat. Um, and um also um i also think that artists that i work with like we said banksy um i think it causes it's very interesting because um like 25 years ago my dad uh who's an attorney was representing artists in miami that were van seen as vandalizing um they were street artists and now people pay people to paint on the side of buildings, which um, is, you know, such a change that has happened. And I think that that's neat in itself and causes people, you know, it's blatantly you have to pass by it and you can't avoid it. So I think that causes your imagination to wonder. And um, I think um, we need imagination because it causes, it creates escape from your reality without, you know. And that's an interesting case with Banksy and also that shift towards valuing street art in a way that perhaps is certainly in certain places. Oh, sorry. I think there's a moral aspect, though, in, um, let's say, removing 
some of his street art, like the physical pieces. I think that's kind of iffy, I'm, you know? Yeah, right. In that then perhaps what we are valuing is that trigger to trigger of the imagination amongst the everyday. So this actually speaks mm -hmm. to, so Susanna saying that she uses um, things, things that you find in, you know, things that you've just found in your artwork, trying to sort of reimagine <laughs> or, or of getting them to do more work than they would do, just left as ordinary items. Suddenly they can be transformed into artworks. So I wonder if we can um, now address this question of, we were talking a little bit about already about whether art can really make a difference in people's lives. But we're at this point now in, in our lives where the world is changing around us and changing really fast, and that can be quite scary. We've got the climate crisis. I mean, we've got all sorts of crises now around the world. And there seems to be this real need rather than just sticking with the status quo. And I think this fits with the idea of people valuing banks. People want to see change. People want to see a possibilities for a new future. Is it always a good thing, though, if art is presenting us with possibilities? Is that is that sort of openness that you were saying that art provides, if it can trigger thoughts about the future, is that always a good thing? Uh, may I? Yeah. Okay. Well, raising awareness about existing issues and problems is one thing, but the, the, there are some artists who are, of course, more visionary. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to talk like more in general than myself here, but if you, if you go into... Uh, people are thinking about the what ifs. Uh, you can envision utopian futures, but there's again, there's this always this going to be this uh, balance between where we are at and what you can envision. And I, I grew up on Asimov, Huxley, Heinlein, uh, Clark, and they dared me to imagine in a way. And now we have, I, we had Carl Sagan back in the day. Now we have Neil deGrasse Tyson. Okay, he's not dealing with sustainability issues, for instance, or any, I mean, name one place there isn't a major crisis about anything. So can art offer that kind of uh, hope for a thing uh, for a future? But remember, if you think back to science fiction, what I grew up with, it's not always, you say, how is it never, I'm asking, how is it never a good thing to, to talk about these uh, uh uh, situations and and if you think about science fiction a lot of them ended up with dystopian and and very bad outcomes to well-intended things now now an art is not going to be a kind of a, a you know the people behind making seeds uh making plants that don't create their own seeds to plant out in the world like you know who um the best laid, laid plans of all society and all humanity don't necessarily go as we want them, and they could turn out to be going very horribly wrong, for instance. So, but these give us lessons. They give us a chance to reflect on them. And like with with uh, uh, Megan's films, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Alexandra's films. You know, it's the, the, you show sometimes some horrible things to spark that imagination, to spark that uh, um, apathy, and 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 to, toward activity even. Um, but let me go on to one other thing uh, because it was sort of similar about what um, um, Megan said. Uh, and I know we're running out of time, but sometimes the venue as a curator and, and somebody who's working with all different kinds of artists as a curator um, and you like Banksy, um, but he is 30 years after me. I was one of the first pioneers of street art with Herring, Busquiat, and uh, uh, Richard Hamilton back in the right. 1980. We are one of us. <laughs> invent. We had to invent a new venue. And sometimes just taking your art, whatever the message you have, and being able to reach more people. I mean, does a, does a tree make a sound when it falls in the woods if no one's there? So you need exposure. <laughs> and we, we have this this more open society now from something me and several other people started way back when as a sort of a frustration of course we wanted to get into the art world but also we wanted to share that mundane daily routine with things that didn't sell you something things that made you feel things that made you think 
And so moving, moving sometimes the, the hope can lie in possibly different things. And now we have internet and we have, uh, I don't know about NFTs, but we have other ways to express ourselves. And I think that's also very important um, uh, for, for the future going ahead. It's interesting that you ended there by saying express, ex we wanted to express ourselves when actually what you'd been talking about up to that point was about it not really being about you, but being about connecting with others, you know, wanting to do street art so that it's mm -hmm. out there for others to engage with. And I, I, I don't know if anybody else, Megan, you're nodding there. Do you want to say anything about that? Oh, no, I just agree um, about take, well, you're taking what, you know, what you believe in and putting it out there um, collectively and letting other people have the same or letting them observe and have their own thought on, you know, what you believe in. Right. And I think yeah. that... I'd say that conversation in itself and visual communication. I wanted to add, though, is that, you know, we might be putting out what we think is a very clear message, but every single person that watches a movie, views the piece of art, has a different response and reaction. Mm -hmm. when, when we hold discussions after our films, it's always surprising to hear which aspects resonated with different people and sort of sometimes the different messages they take away from it. Um, and, and sometimes maybe there's unintended consequences. Hopefully sometimes they're good, but sometimes I think they are bad. I, I mean, I think of like the superhero movies and the Marvel movies and the explosion of them in our society. Um, those are about, you know, good guys fighting bad guys and good is triumphing, which is really, I think the message that they want to get across, but it's also a message of vigilantism and if you look at i mean this american society but off everywhere in the world we're seeing a rise in vigilantism mm -hmm. militia groups i mean january 6 attacks so i don't think marvel was envisioning that in making their movies but that's also a message that came through in those films um it's so unrealistic and black and white as it were, it, it's not yeah. nuanced whatsoever. It's good and evil. Period. That's already before vigilantism. That's already a, a, quite a simple construct that isn't reflecting reality. Yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. You just made me think of, uh, yeah, um, you just made me think of how I've I, in my research of my Irish ancestry, um, finding that a lot of um, Celtic symbols like the Celtic cross have been co-opted by white supremacists. Hmm. So, yeah, and that is still something that I am figuring out what what I'm going, how I'm going to address that. that. But um, yeah, I don't. That's a that's a good question you're raising uh, about <laughs> what's that? I said you're not a bad person. Do you think sometimes? this stuff could lead to people being made examples of um, like that aren't especially like people. with the internet now, you know, when someone was mentioning the internet, it's things go, you know, do get co-opted and um, taken where you don't might not necessarily know, know where ultimately my gut reaction to this question though, is that like imagination, like suppressing imagination is the bad thing, you know, imagine, I mean, imagination must be encouraged. Yeah. And there's, you that's know, my gut the feeling. Bad examples, there's so many good examples too. I mean, yeah. in film and talking yeah. about representation, you know, it's, if you can see it, then you can be it. You know, that phrase that people use. Um, so, so there's a lot of good examples of how, our society has progressed and how art and media has been really a, a big part of that. I mean, one example, like really concrete example on a small level is one of the films that I did was about uh, BMX bike racers in Peckham, London. And they were on this small sort of backyard track and they were 
not able to have a track to compete at the same level as other professionals. And the local council had these stereotypes about, you know, black boys in hoods on bikes and bike gangs and all this stuff. And so they wouldn't give money to build a new track. But then we took our foam footage and they saw like that this was actually a very positive experience. These weren't scary kids. <laughs> they were just mm -hmm. kids having a good time racing on their bikes, having this positive experience. And they invested millions of dollars to build a really large community track for all the kids in the area, which now serves thousands of kids. One of them just this past summer went on to win a medal at the Olympics. Wow. So I do say that, you know, there can be unintended negative consequences, but also a lot of positive stories and art can really do have a positive change. I don't want to end, have us end on a negative note when we're Absolutely. talking about hope here. Um, can I make a summation? But we're almost at the end, right? So can I, can I, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'm quiet. Uh, whatever work we do, whatever art we do, I think it's, we, we must all strive to redefine um, our sense of re resolution towards the amazing, uh, responsible role we each can have as as an as a person, not as the job we do, because the job we don't we're not defined by the job we define the job, and you can move it and stretch it and change it the way you like. And I think that if we can do that, our actions uh, uh, are commensurate with this enormous responsibility um, for any any area of, of the humanities and, and, and maybe not just be so uh, homocentric, all species matter. So we, we've got to start thinking on, on a, a much more inclusive scale and uh, we can do that, but it all starts with ourselves, with each one of us and the roles we play. Wonderful. And um, ju just if I may add something to that, it seems that this isn't just a question about the imagination, but also about sparking conversation. And there's a nice thing about what we've done today as well. We've also used art as a way of sparking a conversation. But I, before we finish, I do just want to allow both Suzanne and Megan to say some final words as well. So if you've got some messages of hope for us about the power of art, Megan, would you like to go first and then we'll finish with Suzanne? Uh, about hope? Um, I think that... Um, that yeah, I think that mid-career art is a, I think the internet's great um, for their careers and as we go on. I'm not so sure about NFTs. Um, they're, <laughs> they're a little volatile <laughs> with crypto, um, but I think there's a lot of hope for growth and that, you know, you don't have to be um you know um an artist at Gagosian to make it <laughs> you could be a mid-career or just starting out and make it nowadays which is awesome so I think that's great <laughs> so Suzanne your yours is the final message of hope through art <laughs> well no I think we are imaginative, like imagine, imagination is going to imagine whether we like it or not. So um, it's our nature. And to me, it's, it's a good, you know, rather than just accepting the status quo, imagination allows you to not be passive. And it could start as an, an internal image or a, an internal sound or movement or whatever. And then you can manifest it and not to get all new age <laughs> manifestation, but you know, you could put it out in the world and um, you, you, you never know. It can and impact you beyond your life. It can impact other people. It can impact, it can impact you, but it can also impact others in ways you might not know, you know? And I think that is very hopeful, you know, um, David was talking about the Lasco cave. It's funny. I was I was thinking about that in terms of this discussion too, because there are these very ancient images that are still mm -hmm. touching people. You know, 
And it's a way of communication, uh, communicating across time. People are still communicating with each other across time. Like my friend, even though like you might not be here in this physical plane. Right. But, but also know? the technologies, I mean, th this came from this, but we had thousands yes. of years to master this. Who can make yes. one of these? Who, what individual can or understand it before it becomes obsolete? So there's hope, but we have much better tools now than we ever had before if we use them wisely. Yeah. Wonderful. Like thank you all <laughs> so much. That's a lovely place for us to end, I think. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.